Uh, I like Majora's Mask because uh, b- because it's cool and uh, and it's awesome and uh, and be- because I like it. Thank you, little Timmy. Very good report. Who's next? I don't want to bore you with this video and just say the same things that have been said a million times before. I think Majora's Mask is so awesome because of its incredible world building. Its atmosphere is so oppressive, it really makes you feel like you fell right down that Alice in Wonderland hole right along with Link and Termina and impending doom. I couldn't even play this game when I was a kid. The moon's face freaked me out too much. Even today, after having played it multiple times, it's like a jump scare anytime you look up at the sky but the scary vibes I got from it are also what really allured me to it. Also, masks are cool as hell. We all wear masks, metaphorically speaking. Today though, I want to fall even deeper into that rabbit hole and talk about some of the lesser known things about the game. It's an interesting world and I want to share some of the things you may have missed in its depths. So let's take a look at some of the secrets of Majora's Mask. Starting with some development stuff, the game's three-day time cycle you relive Groundhog Day style was actually way more elaborate in the initial designing stages. The original concept was for the game to span an entire week, and the graphics for the slates of each day are still in the game's code. It was decided relatively early on in development though that this length of time just tasked players with way too many events and times to have to memorize, so it was stripped back to three days, which allowed for things to always be happening in the world. The game also has some really cool concept art with many unused elements, as well as this hilarious early design of Link. This was drawn back when they were still trying to figure out what Link's age in the game would be. According to Miyamoto, there were originally just under 30 masks in the game back when it was being shown at Space World, but they cut it back down to 24 for the final game. Among these cut masks were an Adult Link transformation mask, but was taken out due to the developers really not knowing what to do with them. Link uses many of the items that were allocated to Adult Link and Ocarina of Time, so there ended up not really being a purpose for him to be included, and many of his attributes were repurposed for the Fierce Deities mask. And by hacking to allow him to use other items than his sword, you can see he utilizes the same animation for playing the Ocarina as Adult Link did in Ocarina of Time. And many other items are usable as well, particularly ones designed for Adult Link and Ocarina of Time. The Young Link designated ones mostly crash the game. But interestingly, it doesn't seem like the concept of the original mask was to take it off to turn back into Young Link, but to have an entire other mask dedicated to doing just that. Enter the horrifying Child Link mask, which also has concept art. This mask is actually still in the game, but doesn't do anything. Its information is actually stored with Skull Kid's object with copies for different scenarios, in the same way Majora's Mask is itself. Which seems to suggest it was intended Skull Kid was at one point intended to wear the mask. And by tampering with some code in the English Virtual Console version, you can even make him wear it instead, resulting in some even more unsettling versions of cutscenes. The intro cutscene also has another oddity about it. At the end of it, until you gain control of Link, he's actually crushed down to the size of Deku Link, which strongly implies this scene originally was designed around Deku Link, so this mask may be more relevant to this scene than we even know. Even preceding this scene though, our first secret is you can activate an alternate opening cutscene on the title screen, which contrasting with the vanilla Clock Town opening, focuses on… pretty much everywhere else. With tastes of Romani Ranch, the Pirate's Hideout, a kind of graveyard, and a sweet final shot of Skull Kid looking up at the moon with this haunting musical sting. Only region that's missing is Snowhead for some reason. There's a couple different ways to get this one to play instead. One way is to simply wait on the title screen for a while until it plays on its own accord, though there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason to when or if it'll even show up. The manual trigger is to quickly press start to get to the file select screen, press up to go onto the option selection, press A, then quickly press B twice to go back to the title screen. And bada bang bada boom, you got it. The Song of Healing is central to the game's story, repairing people's souls and transforming some into masks, but it also has a couple other uses. By playing the song for a slash sign, it'll repair itself, just like Zelda's Lullaby did in Ocarina of Time. But by playing it for the guy running the Poe minigame, he'll say that that song won't fix every problem, but it does cause him to drop the cost of the game from 30 rupees down to just 10. The Song of Storms also has other applications, namely purging curses, and is an easy way to quickly get rid of being jinxed and having to constantly see that prompt. It also lets you skip the bomb chew puzzles on the moon if you play it for the gossip stones for some reason. 
If you follow the river in Akana Valley, there's a load zone that if you enter it will spit you out at the waterfall next to the Hag Potion Shop, a possibly even quicker way to get to Woodfall from Akana than the Song of Soaring. While we're near the potion shop, by hacking the camera, you can see the hag is actually too short to see over the counter and is standing on top of a cardboard box of Satsuma mandarins, which is also noticeable for notably being written in Japanese and not Hylian. Butterflies will often act as tells for hidden grottos, but if you have a Deku stick, you can slowly lead one with it and it'll transform into a fairy for... some reason. Deku sticks are sort of weird in this game. It looks like its texture has been updated to be more detailed than the ones in Ocarina of Time, but really it's just a graphical glitch where the hex codes are meshing with each other to create its look. You can also activate owl statues with them because they still retain their sword-like elements from Ocarina of Time. You know, for when you're in that situation where you've had your sword stolen but you don't have the song Storms and you need to activate an owl statue that pops up all too frequently. If you're a normal person, once you've gotten the jar of gold dust from winning the Goron race, you're probably never touching this area again. But if you go all the way to the end of the track without starting the race, this area has some weird glitch with the camera. For some reason, the area where the camera becomes fixed on this corner at the end of the track lets you use all the primarily first person items in full third person, and some look kind of funny. I particularly like using Deku Link's gross snot bubbles here and seeing how his face gets all scrunched, like it's physically taking all the air in his system just to conjure this disgusting thing. Rupees are abundant in Termina, and aren't hard to come by, but there's a lot of sneaky places the devs chose to hide some of them. We all know about the silver rupee up on the ledge, but did you ever think to shoot the targets outside the shooting gallery? You can even throw a bomb in the middle basket to easily hit both of them. Not impressed by this one? Well, how about this one in the Stockpot Inn where you can get some by hitting this specific mask in the lobby and can only do it with a specific move with the Zora mask? What, is that one still too obvious for you? How about getting some for not only hitting this gong at the beginning of every hour, but also on every half hour as well? Still not impressed? Alright, I'll let you in on one only for the pros. Outside of Clock Town, above this entrance, you can shoot this texture of a clam with your bow for some easy money. Oh, you, you knew about that one too? Well, I guess I just have to concede defeat on this one. Are they gone? Okay, okay. Now that the normies are gone, here's one only for the Majora's Mask Kings who wear their milk bar slash latte depending on the version of the game you're playing Membership Romani's Mask with pride are allowed to know. To get these rupees, you have to leave Clock Town where you got those clam rupees, take out your bow, and shoot these specific bricks. Absolutely insane. There's no tell that these are here at all, and it's the only place this happens. It feels almost like it was a mistake or something. Could this possibly be the most obscure secret rupee location? Eat your heart out, Womp's Fortress 1-Up, you're nothing. If you're feeling devious and just decide to kill a bunch of crows, you'll eventually spawn the big crow. And other than just being big, well, th that's really the only difference, actually. Still dies from one arrow. Continuing on our mischievous escapades, at the Astral Observatory there's a cuckoo trapped in a cage, but you can actually still attack it. Quite effectively, might I add, with the magic Zora's shield. No special cutscene, but you can still see the cuckoo doing its calling animation from Ocarina at a time before a bunch of them start dive-bombing you. Also at the observatory, you can look out the telescope and see some neat things, and at night you can see Clock Town has a lighthouse that turns on, for all the ships coming in, I guess. But you can also test the world a bit, as the light will shine directly at you at the top of the hour, but run a little bit behind every other hour. Maybe the town should change its name. How embarrassing. A neat glitch that's really easy to pull off is that if you try to put the Great Fairy Sword into a mailbox in Clock Town, it'll turn it invisible for some reason. Tons of NPCs will give you situational dialogue depending on the mask you're wearing, including the swordsmen saying some pretty suspicious things about the Great Fairy's mask. But my favorite's gotta be the guy who works the night shift at the curiosity shop. Dude just doesn't care about anything. His appearance also changes the description of the items you can buy too. Dude's just trying to get through the week, I, I get it. You can also hurt cafe if you're fast enough. You can hurt all kinds of children in this game. You can be abusive in a variety of ways actually. Just completely unhinged emotional manipulation happening right here. The dealers at the bomb shop are also working on space travel, with a ton of papers, presumably books, and even models for one, via the use of bomb power. The 3DS remake even expands on this by adding more drawings around the place. So there you go, these Zelda characters are building a rocket. Literal rocket scientists over here, in case you thought the series went too far with technology when Link had a train. 
The 3DS version also adds a giant GameCube to the shop's background, as well as the Ultra Hand, which was this toy Nintendo made back in the 60s, and is pretty self-explanatory. The toy was designed by Nintendo employee Gunpei Yokoi, who is best known for going on to break into the video game scene with Nintendo down the line, designing the Game & Watch and original Game Boy, which was named by Shigesato Atoy. He was also a longtime producer on the Metroid and Kid Icarus games. Another toy designed, however, was the Nintendo Love Tester, where each participant, player, holds one of the metal balls with one hand, and the hand of the other with their other hand to determine their connection. Anyway, I bring all this up because this also made it into the 3DS version. It appears in the Great Bay Laboratory. The 3DS version also added a hidden rob and a stone Wiimote. Both versions of the game, however, have this paper airplane on top of a stone pillar at Iconic Castle, though. Some interesting lore. Apparently guns exist in Zelda. I... I mean, I, I think they do. They, they call it gunpowder, so I assume they wouldn't call it that if there weren't any guns to powder. While on this topic, let's jump to Link's Crossbow Training. Remember this? This game was my introduction to the Zelda series, funny enough. Anyway, apparently when this game was in early development and the team was figuring out exactly what they wanted to do with it, Miyamoto suggested that he wanted Link to be transported to the future, Terminator style, and to be trying to fight his way back home with an actual gun. The rest of the team promptly shut down that idea and just made it Twilight Princess inspired, but what a hilarious yet awesome idea. Not at all related to Majora's Mask, but where the hell else am I going to talk about this? Speaking of Miyamoto though, one of the most famous pieces of iconography from the game is the Elegy of Emptiness statue, which is very scary. These statues represent the original person the Transformation Mask is an extension of, the butler's son, Darmani, and Macau. But who's this one of Link? The prevailing view is that the statue's face is based on Miyamoto himself. There's no official backing to this, but I like this interpretation, as the series was conceived based on Miyamoto's adventures in the wilderness as a child, so his face on young Link is pretty fitting, I think. The one I'm less sure about is that the mask salesman is based on Miyamoto. Not gonna say it's impossible, he even has a Mario mask on his backpack, but would that mean that this one-off character in Ocarina of Time was also based on his likeness? If that's the case, why? While hunting the bombers, you can lure one of the ones in this area to hide inside a box, and they just hang out there, solid snake style. A weird one that's probably a glitch is that if you hold down the button for the map while playing an instrument, Link just won't move while playing it for some reason, in any of his forms. In case you love using the Goron mask in areas with tons of water, like a freak, if you wear it in Woodfall Temple and step onto one of these flowers that usually eats human Link, it'll try to eat Goron Link and just explode. In fact, you can mess with all sorts of enemies as a Goron here. Believe it or not, the Mask of Sense actually does do something. It lets you use a bottle at the end to swipe up an easy magic mushroom, which you can give to the hag at the potion shop to get a free potion if you come back. Something else I learned about Zelda from reading all the interviews to collect information for this video is that in Japan there's actually unofficial quote unquote lyrics to the Zelda fanfare that Awada himself acknowledges. Does that make them canon? Anyways, the lyrics are SESAME SAUCE Lastly, I want to talk about the manga adaptation. It's a quick 200 page Cliff Notes version of the game's story. And I mean Cliff Notes. You don't even see any of the temples in it. The bosses just sort of show up in the area. I get cuts have to be made for length, but come on, Stone Tower Temple is one of the coolest locations in the entire series, and it's not even mentioned. This place is insinuated to be the Zelda version of the Tower of Babel and nothing? I like that it plays up the alternate dimension angle of the story though, with Link creeped out by how everyone looks like their Hylian counterparts. But overall, it's fine. The highlight though is definitely the bonus chapter at the end, a prequel chapter that I'd like to go over. Keep in mind that the manga is not canon, so this is just purely to archive the story. The story takes place before, well, everything. 10 million years in the past, in an unnamed wasteland. There's a large dragon type creature, you know, just chillin', doing his thing when a human approaches him. The dragon is Majora itself and is skeptical of the human's intentions, as it knows its armor is a great commodity that can grant wishes, which has led to travelers in the past attempting to slay it. The traveler dismisses Majora's accusation, claiming to not know the legend and just wanting to stop and rest. Majora explains humans have come before to try to steal his armor and he's eaten every single one of them. The traveler says he has no wishes, and thus no desire to slay Majora. He reveals he was drawn to the wasteland almost by a spiritual inclination, and that he was aware of the monster's existence and had wondered how long it had been alone, just waiting to die, basically calling him pathetic. Majora confesses it doesn't really know what it's doing anymore, and the Traveler takes out his drum. He starts playing music and commands the beast to dance. 
He does so for three days straight and dies from exhaustion, leaving only his armor behind. The Traveler, the fierce deity, cuts up the armor, creating a mask, sealing its evil magic away. I hope you sleep here forever, and then drops it into the depths of the earth. You see a lot of people saying Majora's Mask is a great game in its own right, but something I think is missing from the conversation a lot of the time is how it's also a great sequel. I really appreciate how it continues the themes of Link's story from Ocarina of Time. Think about it, these games are all about the weight of crushing expectations. Not an uncommon theme in games, but I think these two games demonstrate it very well. In Ocarina, Link's tasked with her clan task of having to save his country while he's, what, 8? 10? And the task is so big he can't even do it unless he gives up his childhood. Ever notice how Hyrule sucks once you become an adult? That's just life, man. Then in Majora, the expectations somehow get even more unreasonable. Save the country again, but now also stop a cosmic entity and a god as well. Also, this time stay a child, but still grow up, you gotta use those items. We're just not gonna help you this time. Life sucks no matter what age you are. No big deal, this isn't a lot for a 12 year old. Look at the cute monkeys! And you can go even further with this analysis if you follow the Hero Time story further down the series. But I also think that's why it endures, you know? They both really speak to that collectively shared human experience. As you can see, this game really strikes a chord with me, and I hope this video was able to share with you at least one or two things you may not have known before. I think this shows just how many deep secrets there are to discover in its world outside its story even. The thing you don't realize is that you do actually fall right down the rabbit hole with Link, into a mysterious, off-kilter version of the world you know, where cartoon characters have to face their very real demise. It's a beautiful game, but at the same time, it makes you feel like this. A strange blend of different negative yet attentive emotions. Truly, a mask in its own right. Metaphorically speaking...